What's up, Brozones? Welcome to the Ozone, and welcome to epilogue number four. This is what a lot of people have been waiting for. I'm so hyped to get started on this. Um, real quick, let's just reflect on Submechanophobia as a book. Submechanophobia started with a story that was a pretty good setup and a pretty good payoff. Right, I would say it it was a very kind of average Tales from the Peter Plex story. I don't mean average in terms of like the Fazbear Frights, because Fazbear Frights, I feel like the quality was a lot lower. But Tales, the quality is higher and that means the bar is higher. So I think that uh, Summer Canophobia, if you put that in Fazbear Frights, it is like an A tier story. But in Tales, I think it's quite average, uh, even though the twist was really good. And then we moved on to the second one, which I've actually forgotten the name. Oh, Animatronic Apocalypse, which was, it, it had a weird dread in it. And it was really well written. And it was a really weird mystery that did get resolved and was actually quite lore heavy. And looking back at it, I think it's honestly one of my favorite stories. It's just, it's really cool. I, I really enjoyed it, actually. Uh, and then, of course... The Bobby Dots Part 1. I, like, I can't even speak. Like, I mean, I, I, I don't have any words for it. It's it's just all around phenomenal. Literally a 10 out of 10. It, the only way it could have gone better is if it didn't end on a cliffhanger. But um, we are on epilogue number 4. In terms of the epilogues... Um, I actually got a little bit bored of them. I don't know if it's because we're waiting so long for each epilogue to come out. I mean, it's always been the same, but like, I don't know. I got a little bit bored of constantly hearing about this endo. And I, I started to kind of lose interest. Even though there were really cool deaths happening, uh, I kind of started to lose interest a little bit uh, in number two and number three. Number one fire it was absolutely fire i hope we get more kind of things like that but i don't know it seems like we're going to be following this group for a while and i i'm not sure if i like that or not but uh we will talk about that once i finish this because i'm just even though i'm uh, i'm a little bit bored of this i i am still very hyped to see what we, what we've got in store for these characters so epilogue four we don't have time for this Lucia whispered intently to Adrian. Adrian looked up from where he knelt next to Wade, who was doubled up, dry heaving, having already emptied his stomach out over a decayed tangle of ripped off arms and legs. Adrian, his eyes red, his face wet with tears that he was letting run ashamed, ashamedly down his perfect cheeks, glanced up at Lucia. He nodded once, but he didn't move. Jace squeezed her hand so hard her knuckles cracked. Chase had grabbed her hand as they all ran down the hallway, away from the thing that had killed Hope. His hand was clammy and cold, but fear uh, gave his fingers strength. Joel suddenly says, you know what, I'm going to grab my best friend Wade by the arm and separate him from the rest. Joel suddenly reached down and grabbed Wade by his upper arm. Come on, he hissed. Wade, his six-foot athletic physique, diminished by shock and grief, didn't resist as Joel yanked him to his feet. Adrian, who had straightened when Joel began manhandling Wade, wiped away his tears. Um, where are you going? He called out softly to Joel. Away from here, Joel flung back over his shoulder. Well, Joel just ran off with Wade. Adrian looked at Lucia and Jace, then he started... Pa uh, then he stared past Lucia's shoulder and his brows twitched in something that looked like surprise. Lucia whirled, shivers rippling down her spine in the sudden conviction that the awful thing had snuck up behind her, but it hadn't. Adrian was looking at Kelly, who was standing just a foot or so behind Lucia. Ke Kelly's face was unexpectedly placid. She was alert, yes. Her gaze was fixed on the lobby, but she didn't have the bug-eyed, pasty-skinned look that everyone else had. It's odd how Kelly's always been singled out from the rest of the group, even ever since Epilogue 2. That is a good point. Are you saying she's sus? Hmm. Kelly. Shy and quiet Kelly didn't look like someone who had just seen her best friend violently, violently dismembered. Well, it has to be, right? It's like, um... What's it called? Uh, Arkham's Razor? No, not Arkham's Razor. Um... 
I forgot what the other one is. But oh, oh, the gun, the gun one. Um, I don't know. It, it, it's just like if something is mentioned in a story, it kind of has to come back up again. Otherwise, what's the point of putting it there? Um, maybe Kelly was disassociating. Uh, that's that's a that's a thought. Lucy thought it was a realistic way to handle severe trauma, but was it one that would keep her alive? A crunch came from the hallway, not too close, but close enough. Adrian motioned for Lucia, Jace, and Kelly to follow him, and he in turn trotted after Joel and Wade, who were heading toward the doorway to the black back hallway. Sorry, as she hurried past the tangle of bar height stools, Lucia kicked up a cloud of old red confetti. Uh, Lucia tried to tell herself that she and the others would be able to hide from the deadly thing that killed Hope until they could find a way to get out of the abandoned restaurant, but she had a feeling she was lying. Big time. Hmm. Joel hauled Wade into the back hallway. He propped his friend against the wall and held him there with the flat of his hand. He leaned in and got Wade's face. Dude, you just need to get a grip. You want to die too? You want to die too? Wade... His face smeared with tears, his breath rank and sour, blinked red eyes at Joel. Joel sighed and gave Wade a light head slap. Wade grunted and frowned, but the head slap worked. Joel exhaled. Good. A snivelling friend wasn't going to be a helpful friend. And Joel knew he would need help if he was going to get out of this hellhole. No way was he going to end up like Hope or like Nick. No way. He hears footsteps, but he isn't spooked because it's not the menacing footsteps the creature makes, which seem to be powerful enough to be distinctive. Kind of like a, radi a terror radius. It's the others. Uh, AD Adrian, Jace, and the two girls clustered together as they joined Joel and Wade. You okay? Adrian asked Wade. They congregated together and don't want to talk about what they just witnessed. So they tried to think of what to do next. What now? Jace asked. The nerdy little artist's voice was squeaky. Joel suppressed an eye roll. He didn't like Jace and had no idea why Adrian hung out with him. It was embarrassing. When Lucia and I were in the office, Kelly spoke up. We saw an old radio. We might be able to get that thing working and call for help. Joel raised an eyebrow. He'd never heard Kelly say more than three or four words at a time. And whenever he'd heard her talk, her voice had always been soft and breathy. Now it was strong and smooth, confident. Wow. What's what's going on with Kelly? <laughs> is she an animatronic? Um, that's a good idea, Lucia said. I might be able to jerry-rig it to cool out. But the office is right next to the parts and service. Jace squeaked again. Bro squeaked. That's a good point, Joel said. He hated to agree with the mouse. And besides, Joel added, I think it's better. It's a better idea to just get out of here. We haven't thoroughly explored that room at the end of the hall. Maybe there's an exit through there. He gestured toward the far end of the hallway. Adrian shook his head. We saw that room when we were running around the first time trying to find a way out. But it's just the systems room. The furnace and all that. There's no way in there. Oh, there's no way out in there. Joel scowled. We didn't try that hard to find a way. We just ran on to the next room looking for a window that would open. Maybe we missed a crawl space or something. Adrian pressed his lips together, thinking. Joel might... Uh, sorry, Joel thought Adrian looked like a priss when he did that. Like stuck-up royalty or something. A thud sounded from the dining room. Discussion was over. Hmm. Okay. The whole group began scampering down the hallway, away from the dining room. The first room off to the right of the hallway was the employees' lounge and locker room. Adrian turned into that room. Lucia, Kelly and Jace followed him. Joel, on the other hand... <laughs> uh, Wade started that way too but Joel grabbed his arm again Wade made a little sound of protest but he didn't say anything as Joel jerked him away from the employee's lounge and pulled him further down the hall Joel heard heavy taps interspersed with a hissing rasp the taps were nearing the hallway's entrance Joel! Adrian called out Joel didn't answer he kept running dragging Wade along with him they had to get to the little room at the end of the hall before the killing thing spotted them. Forget the stupid old radio. Joel wanted out. Now. And he was going to find a way. Lucia grabbed Adrian's arm and pulled him into the employee's lounge. Let them go, she whispered as she quickly pushed the door closed. Adrian's self-assurance had left him, she realised. She, she didn't fault him for that. 
Um, he had, after all, just watched his girlfriend get murdered by... What was that thing, anyway? A robot? No. Something more than that. A monster? No. A creature? Lucia settled on a creature... What is this? This is a neat callback to the insanity ending. Oh, true. Uh, Lucia settled on the creature because it sounded less formidable. She doubted her brain would go back, uh, go for that word trick, but it was a night. It was worth a try. Sorry, I'm stumbling a lot. Outside the closed door, the hissing, rasping taps moved down the hall. The already dim lit, the already dim lights in the staff room went out. Lucia froze and held her breath. She could tell that the others were doing the same. The blackness of the room was so fully complete that Lucia could almost feel it physically. It felt like a vicious cloak enfolding itself around her. A scream tried to claw its way up her throat, but she tampered it down, and then the lights came back on. They flickered, but they didn't go out again. Kelly made a small pss sound. Lucia looked toward her. They found the radio. Then does the little transition of Kelly leading the group for some reason. She's pantomiming the direction of where they should head. She's holding the radio. Strange how she's suddenly so confident. Then after the short segment, it switches to Wade and Joel. We should have gone with the others. Wade said as Joel shut the door to the systems room. Shh, Joel said. He's barricading the door with the wooden crate he found in the room. Joel knew that if he could lift it, the crate wasn't heavy enough to stop a metal monster capable of popping off he human heads and limbs, but maybe it would slow the thing down. And maybe the creature followed the others. As terrible as he thought it was, uh, as the thought was, he Joel really hoped it did. Like all the other rooms in the old pizzeria, this one was filled with dust. It also held a rusting old furnace bulging with pipes and chutes that extended in several directions and were entangled with broken down scaffolding. This room, unlike the rest of the rooms in the abandoned restaurant, was two stories tall. A couple of the furnace chutes extended up to the top of the room's high ceiling. The rest of them bent around the corner of the room's L-shaped corner. The room smelled faintly of rotten eggs. Joel didn't know much about furnaces, but he remembered that smell coming from his grandpa's old one when he was when it was going bad. This particular one wasn't functioning, Joel didn't think, but something in this room was running. He could hear a humming sound that uh, that alternated with a rapid, rhythmic whoosh, uh, whoosh. It sounded like a fan. Joel turned his back on Wade and started poking around in the old furnace. It didn't take him long to check it out. The bulk of it sat in a 15-foot square space but its chutes reached beyond that space. Joel was particularly interested in the ones that stretched upward. Furnace chutes don't normally end up in places like that. The light in this room was as pitiful as the light in the rest of the pizzeria, but Joel was pretty sure that one of the furnace chutes disappeared into a venting system on the ceiling. A furnace chute that leads into the pizzeria vent system. Huh, wonder what that could be. I'm, I'm not recalling. Oh, as in how the, the fire started? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what's going on. What I, yeah, like the furnace isn't like, I feel like I should know what this furnace is, but I don't. It, I guess it's where the fire started, right? And it, it's going directly into the vents and the animatronics were in the vents and that's how they got killed or whatever or burnt. <laughs> um, what if there was a way out through that system? He cometh. Wade looked toward Joel as a clank emanated from down the hallway, from a pretty good distance. Both Joel and Wade cocked their heads and listened. The clank was followed by silence. They waited a few seconds. Then Joel motioned for Wade to follow him around the corner of the room's L. Joel pointed upward. I want to climb up there and see what's beyond the end of the chute. I think it's a venting system. They're climbing up the chute. Wade found a, found a panel in the chute. I think this panel comes off. Wade whispered. He pointed. Joel saw what Wade was looking at. There was an oxidised metal panel. The metal panel was on the furnace wall between the... Sorry. The metal panel was on the furnace wall beneath the main chute. It was held on with bolts, but the bolts were crumbling. Maybe because they were burnt. Uh, oxidised metal usually means it was in contact with fire, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Oh, were people asking? In the, okay. Successfully, they pried the panel open with a bleak metallic pop. Wade quickly reached out and caught it before it could clatter to the floor. Good hands, Joel whispered. <laughs> Bro? The best part is, Wade didn't respond. The panel wasn't all that big, but its removal exposed an opening big enough for Joel to shove his shoulders through. 
he immediately pushed in through the opening and looked up. Ha-ha! <laughs> All right! His voice echoed in the enclosed chute. What? Wade asked. There are metal handholds and footholds in here. I think this is a maintenance chute. That's one way to call it. He's calling through it. I'm not going to lie. I'm so confused. <laughs> but we, we keep going. Uh, the interior of the chute was nearly dark, but the glow of an exposed bulb on the wall near the chute managed to creep in through the cracks in the chute's decaying metal. As he suspected, it was part of a ventilation system. He crawled upward. Yeah, if only he went down. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Could he have gone down? Did it say that there was something that went down? Because I think you're alluding to um, Circus Babies, right? Circus Babies Entertainment Rentals. Because I feel like that's what's going to happen in Ruin. We're going to find Circus Babies. Because technically, under FNAF 6, uh, there is Circus Babies. Because that's what Fredbear's was before. Um, so, wait, did I say FNAF 6? I, I don't know. No, no, I did. I'm talking a load of rubbish. Basically, underneath uh, the pizza place, there should be circus babies entertainment and rentals and i'm hoping that these guys find it but if not we're gonna see it in ruin i'm calling it um the maintenance shoot ended in front of a huge metal fan the fan's blades were rotating quickly and steadily down is where pizzeria simulator would be he went up instead oh okay i'm lost then <laughs> he peered between the blades yes just as he'd hoped he'd seen light bright light just a slice of it but it was unmistakable Joel could see sunlight. This was their way out. For I was literally at the labyrinth entrance and went up. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah. Um, all they had to do was figure out how to turn off the fan. They Then they'd all be able to slip through the openings between a blade. Wade was slumped against the wall, once again staring into space. I found the way out, Joel said, catching his breath. Wade blinked. His slack face regained a little colour. Really? Yes, there's a fan in the chute, and beyond the fan I can see a little sunlight from a vent on the roof, I think. All we have to do is figure out how to turn off the fan. Joel is a cycle path. We need to tell the others, Wade said. Joel shook his head. There's no time. That thing is out there, and it's not going to be long before it checks in here. All we need to do is get ourselves out, and... But we can't leave, Wade interrupted. We'll get help for the others once we're out, Joel interrupted. The truth was... Joel couldn't have cared less about the others. Oh my gosh. That's a... Uh, that hurt. <laughs> that hurt me. First of all, Adrian was a pretty boy who was too big for his britches. I, I don't get that. <laughs> uh, Jace was a sniveling nerd. Vine boom. Lucio was a weirdo. And Kelly was... Well, admittedly, Kelly was pretty. But she wasn't pretty enough to come before Joel's right to get out of this place alive. You know what? These guys deserve to die. <laughs> you got one person who's super sus and just doesn't care that their friends died. you got one person who doesn't care if their friends die in the future. They're, they're just a, a bunch, aren't they? They all deserve to die. <laughs> what if that thing gets them before we can get help back here? Wade said. What if it gets us before we can tell them about the way out? Joel countered. That thing could be right outside the door for all we know. Joel is peer pressuring Wade and calling him weak because he's an athlete, but he's not rough enough in a situation like this. Wade gives in to it, but because he's his only friend. Wade sucked in his breath. He turned toward the closed door. He nodded. Good, Joel said. Let's find a way to shut off that fan. Let me just quickly take a drink. I've been recording for like two hours straight. Ah. That's nice. Um, Adrian closed the office door as quietly as he could. He felt the tension bunch in his shoulders when the latch made a clicking sound. He put his head up against the door and listened. He and the others had heard the huge creature coming down the back hall as they cut through the employee lounge to exit out the other door. It sounded like the creature went on down the hall, but Adrian couldn't be sure. It could have passed through the lounge after them and be coming for them. Adrian turned to look at Lucia and the others. Are you sure you can figure out how to get our radio working? He asked Lucia. I can try. Just see if you can keep that metal monster from getting in here while I do. They parricaded the door with a desk. Kelly and Lucia are whispering to each other about technicalities on how to reroute the radio. I'm guessing Kelly knows tech stuff too. Okay. Kelly seemed to be following what Lucia was telling her. She even off offered her own ideas. 
Wow, this wow, this is cool. Wait, that's from Bobby Dots? That's really cool. Um Adrian was beginning to realise that there was far more to Kelly than she'd ever let on. Lucy and Kelly exchanged a glance. They were bonding, Adrian realised. Two brainy girls in a situation that had nothing to do with being popular or fitting in. Strangely, they were in their element. <clears throat> this is strange because that segment was really short. It now cuts back to Joel and Wade. Yeah, I, I actually blanked out. Um, so yeah, that's there for a reason, obviously. Wade looked at Joel and shook his head. It's no use, he said. After turning every knob and pushing every button on the room's control panel and on the furnace itself, he and Joel still hadn't been able to find to, to get the fan to stop turning. It must be on another circuit, Wade said. Its own circuit. And who knows where that is. Hey, Joel shook Wade by the shoulder. Wade frowned and pushed Joel away. Joel didn't protest. He pounced on the balls of his feet like an excited little kid. I have an idea. Wade waited for what he assumed would be something boneheaded, and just as he expected, something boneheaded. Remember how the lights went out when the creature showed up, before it killed Hope? Joel asked. Something about that thing affects electricity, right? Wade shrugged. If we could lure it in here, get it close, the power to that fan should shut off, shouldn't it? And we could get out. Oh my gosh. That's the worst idea you've ever had. <laughs> oh, you mean after it tears us apart? Wade raised an eyebrow. Funny, but I'm not joking around. If the creature sh shorts things out, it could short out the fan. We just need to make sure it's close and then get up the chute before it grabs us. He says more stupid stuff. It gets worse. All you have to do is go out there and get the robot's attention and then get it to chase you back in here. Me? Wade glared at Joel. Why me? It's your stupid idea. Joel made a face and gestured at his fire plug like body. I'm the centre on the basketball team, not the forward. Power, not speed. He tapped his chest. Linebacker. He poked Wade's chest. Quarterback. You're the king of a scramble, remember? No one outmanoeuvres tacklers like you do. Wade opened his mouth to protest, but he didn't get any words out. Joel actually had a point, and his plan, although stupid and dangerous, wasn't half bad. Wade made himself remember how the creature had moved in the parts and service room. Was it fast? Not really. It was crazy strong, yeah. But when it moved, it was cumbersome. He could outmaneuver it. The only way we're going to get out of here, Joel said, is to get past that fan. Okay, Wade said. Joel raised both eyebrows. Really? Why not? Wade meant that. Why not? It would give him something to do besides wallowing grief and terror. And transition cut to Lucia. This is a really good segment. We're halfway through. Oh, we're only halfway through? Okay. Lucia snatched her handbag when the radio's wires sparked for the third time. Crap! She, she resisted the urge to put her head in her hands. It wasn't working. She and Kelly had rewired the radio and reconfigured its frequency, but it wasn't receiving anything but static, and the wires were so old that they couldn't hold together. Kelly's taking over while Lucia just relaxes because she's stressed. She looks around the office. Lucia wanted to say something to Adrian, something comforting, something more than her. Sorry about Hope from earlier, but she wasn't any good at that kind of thing. And what would be comforting anyway? It's horrible that your girlfriend lost her head. Do you want to talk about how you feel about Hope being brutally murdered? No and no. And was Hope murdered? Murder required premeditation. Could a machine, because she was pretty sure the creature was some kind of horrible machine, commit murder? She wonder what could possibly be making a machine kill like that. Could it be something that was built to do that? Lucia doubted it. In another place, another time, Lucia might have enjoyed kicking around these questions. She might have even di liked discussing the ideas with Kelly. Here's where it gets interesting with Kelly and provides the theme of this epilogue. Oh. While they worked on the radio, Kelly had chatted. Lucia was pretty sure it was nervous chatter, but it wasn't your typical girly nonsense. Kelly talked about how she felt. Kelly talked about her feelings, about how she always felt less than what, when she was around Hope. That's why she was so shy, she explained. She never felt like she had much to contribute in a group. She was overshadowed. It didn't escape Lucia's awareness that this, build, that this budding friendship with Kelly wouldn't have been possible if Hope was still alive. This explained what Lucia had been feeling for the last half hour, she realised. She felt guilt. 
At first she didn't know why, but now she did. It was because Hope's death had benefited her. Hope meant Adrian was now available. Not that she'd, he'd shown any interest in Lucia in that way. And it meant a super cool girl could come out into the light and be herself. Really cool perspective of morality here I haven't seen done before. That's true. That's true. Yeah, she's not happy Hope's dead. The point is she doesn't like that Hope is dead because it hasn't done anything but benefited her. Yeah. That's... Oh, wow. Wait, that is... That's really good writing. That's a, that's that is a perspective I don't think we've ever seen before. No, that's really cool. Nothing, huh? Lucia asked. She frowned at the radio. Then she snapped her fingers. Maybe there's a manual or something. Lucia rushed over to the filing cabinet. Even though it lay on its side, she could still get to the folders stuffed in the drawers. She began rifling through them or riffling through them. Sorry. Although she sorted quickly. At one point, her hand came to an abrupt stop. Reaching into a file, she yanked out what looked like an old, yellowed operator's manual. What's that? Kelly asked. It's an operator's manual, Lucia said, skimming its pages quickly. She opened the manual to the last page and tapped the drawing she'd seen there. That's the thing, Kelly breathed. Lucia flipped the page and read some more. It's an old user's manual, she said. It describes a bunch of different ki kinds of robotic endoskeletons. Its name is Mimic. The one we saw is either a Mimic Model 1 or 2. These things are pretty creepy. They have retractable and expandable limbs. It's a spring lock? No way. This isn't a spring lock. There's no way, right? That's really cool. Okay. Contracting torso. So they can fit into pretty much any mascot costume. Wait a second. Okay, wait. Let me let me see N Tom's explanation. Pressure described the spring locks as exactly like this. For those who don't know, we not only have an official name for the spring lock endos, aka the mimic models, but that endo is a spring lock. The endo is a spring lock. Okay, that's great. That's really good in information. That's great information. Thank you so much for that information, epilogue number four. <laughs> the manual they're reading is specifically really, really old. It's crumbling and yellowing, so it's dated for decades. Um, Lucia frowned and read some of the small print under the sketch of the thing that had killed Hope. Oh, jeez, she gasped. Lucia looked up from the manual. Apparently the tech in the mimics was pretty clunky. It says that if you encounter one of these things, you should immediately disconnect its power source and disassemble it. Um, she looked at the others. That's not good. We need to get out of here. Kelly's being weird because she immediately stops Lucia. Stop, Kelly said. We need to get a grip on ourselves. Maybe we need to clear our heads for a few minutes. Lucia rolled her shoulders to release her pent-up tension. Okay. What's your favourite colour? Kelly asked Jace. And why? Jace blinked several times and then frowned. Without looking up from his sketch pad, he said, Yellow, because it makes me think of fuzzy chicks. He glanced up at Kelly through his messy, thick black bangs and gave her a half smile. He's a softie. She smiled back. Good. Mine's green, bright green, because it's the colour of seedlings. That makes me think of how things can grow, how people can grow. What about you, Lucia? Purple. It's the colour of a really good deep bruise, something painful. Something painful and real. The words had just tumbled out and Lucia regretted them immediately. That might have been a little too raw. That might have been a little too raw. Did she really want Adrian to know how dark her mind was? It's then awkward after that. Everyone's looking at each other. And then she asks Adrian the same question. He says blue. And then he skips back to Joel. Now the rest of this epilogue is my favourite part of this epilogue. It's awesome. Okay, okay. Joel stood by the door to the hallway. He listened intently. At least 60 seconds had passed since Wade had gone through the door. Obviously, the creature wasn't outside in the hallway because the only sound Joel hears, or Joel heard as he closed the door, was Wade's soft footballs heading down the hallway. Okay, now. Jade's, uh, Jade? Who is, who, uh, that's just a mix of Joel and Wade. Uh, Joel strode away from the door and trotted to the bottom of the chute. Shoving his bulk through the barely wide enough opening, he began shimmying up the shaft. <laughs> uh, as he climbed, he thought about Wade. Would he be able to get a creature close without getting killed? 
In the back of his mind, Joel was aware that they were in this mess because of him. He had been this... It, he had been his idea to come check out the construction site, but Wade has his part in it too. He was the one who'd spotted the way into the old pizzeria, served him right to be the bait that would get Joel out of here. Joel had to look out for number one. It was a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Everyone, every person for themselves. Every little hair on the back of Wade's neck stood on end as he eased down the hallway toward the dining room. Looking left and right, rotating regularly to glance down the hall, Wade was aware the creature could appear at any moment. He really hoped that flickering lights would give him enough warning to run. He just needed a head start. He figured that if he, figured if he had that, he could stay ahead of the mammoth animatronic killer. That was why... He was heading toward the restaurant's main room, even though it was littered with mangled tables and chairs, old party debris and construction supplies, not to mention body parts, it was still the largest area in the old building. He wanted some, uh, space to manoeuvre, but he wasn't going to get it. The lights started to flicker just as Wade was passing one of the swinging doors that led into the kitchen. Wade whirled. Where was it? Over the deafening sound of his pound pounding heart, Wade heard the tap-hiss rasp of the robot's footsteps. They were coming from the employee's lounge. He's here. Wade m ran into the kitchen and immediately Mimic began darting right toward the kitchen door following him. When Wade ducked down into the kitchen, the lights went out. The scratching taps entered the kitchen. Wade is silently crouching down as the Mimic walks through the kitchen listening for him. As he crouched, his hands slid over a stack of pizza pans. They cascaded to the ground and scattered with clangs and jangles. He heard it. The taps stopped. A heavy vibration shuddered through the kitchen. A long hiss came from the opposite side of the kitchen island. The thing was there. Scrambling on his hands and knees, Wade gathered pizza pans as he crawled as fast as he could around the island back in the direction he'd come from. The floor's reverberations told him the creature was following him. Wade shot to his feet and he ran at full speed. He raced around the island and blasted back through the door he'd just come through. As he surged into the hall, its lights flicked, flickered on. As he searched into the hall, it's like, stop doing this. <laughs> um, Wade glanced over his shoulder. The creature was nothing more than a hulking shape in the kitchen's continued darkness. Watching it move was like watching the undulating motion of a shadow monster. Its progress wasn't fast, but it was steady. Its progress wasn't fast, but it was steady, Wade, honey. Without thinking about why he was doing it, Wade started firing pizza pans toward his pursuer. He's throwing pizza pans at Afton. <laughs> He flung them as if they were frisbees, whipping them toward the robot's neck. Wade didn't have any delusions that a pizza pan could take out a monster made of metal, but he thought they might be enough of a nuisance to slow the thing down, and he might even get lucky and dislodge a cable to disable the thing. Or maybe not. Even in the kitchen's blackness, we could, he could see the pizza pans bouncing off the robot's shoulders and chest. Wade started uh, toward the dining room, but he lost his footing. He stumbled and fell, skidding down the hallway floor away from the dining room. The creature exited the kitchen. The kitchen's lights came on as the swinging door closed behind the thing. The lights went off, then they flickered on again. The mimic was right in front of him between the space of the dining area and the kitchen. Wade ran again down the hall as the mimic chases him. See, now Wade's smart, because he knows the mimic is actually somewhat intelligent. He wants to flank him. As he ran, Wade formed a plan. Wade had briefly considered running down the hall toward the system's room when the creature pursued him into the hall. But running the length of the hall in the dark, the thing right behind him, wasn't something he wanted to do. He needed more of a head start to get into the chute. What he had to do was get out ahead of the creature before he let it spot him. Wade thrashed over a pile of chairs, once again losing his balance. He went down hard, cracking his knee on the edge of a metal locker. But he didn't let the pain stop him. Uh, he ran off into the dining room. The lights are flickering. He doesn't know where it is. It seems he lost him. But then he heard the hissing footsteps too close. Afton had flanked him instead. Then he heard it. The hissing steps were close. Too close. The creature hadn't followed him. It had gone back the other way. Into the dining room. The lights flickered. The room went dark. A claw reached out. Wade turned to run. But before he could, metal grazed his forearm. It dug into his skin. But he kept running. The robot's hissing rasp was closer now. Wade couldn't see the thing, but he could sense it reaching for him. He can imagine its metal fingers extending toward its throat. Wade juked to the left and then dropped to his knees and rolled. 
As he came back up to his feet, burning hot pain shot through his right shoulder. The creature had tried to grab him and missed. Wow, he duked William Afton? And Afton is pissed. Okay. The creature had tried to grab him and missed, but its razor-sharp fingers had scored uh, Wade's flesh. Deep blood was, rish was rushing down Wade's side. He ignored it. He ran and scrambled, duking Afton again in between the chairs and tables in the dining area. You do not want to make Afton angry. Wade began darting left and right as if trying to avoid being sacked on the football field. Joel had been right. Wade was good at scrambling. So he scrambled. He bobbed and weaved and he scuttled toward the arcade. He just double duked Afton and ran off into an arcade room. He ran into the arcade, still bleeding, but ducked between some pinball machines. Get to that point! <laughs> the arcade went dark immediately and Afton entered, searching for him. Wade began crawling silently. Wade held his breath, stayed low and circled around the arcade's perimeter until he found himself back in the dining room. He, uns he, sorry, he successfully snuck past Afton. Afton's still in the arcade looking for him. The dining room's lights came on and Wade found himself standing next to an overturned table that lay in the puddle of a torn purple striped clay tablecloth. Clutching his forearm and trying not to think about the gash on his back, Wade scanned the area. He didn't have a big enough head start yet, especially now he was injured. He was losing a lot of blood and he could feel his legs weakening. He needed to hide until the creature moved further off. But where? Wade looked toward the stage. No. Too far. He glanced at the overturned tables and chairs. Not enough cover. He turned and looked at one of the piles of decaying body parts. His stomach flipped over. His skin crawled. Every fibre of his being yelled no. He ignored the advice. He got a running head start. Wade, Wade leaped over a couple of chairs and he dived right into the pile of dismembered arms, legs, heads and torsos. Ew. Wade buried himself under the grotesque, deconstructed remains of the robot's old victims. Like an animal, he burrowed beneath the spongy flesh and brittle bones. He was encapsulating himself in the pile of dismembered arms, legs, heads and torsos. Everything in his right mind is telling him to get out. Primal instincts are making his body freak out, but he doesn't care. He wants to survive. Keeping his eyes closed, Wade breathed as little as possible as he flattened himself to the floor. Then he lay still and listened. The thing was nearby. He held his breath. Blood continued to flow from his wounds. He could feel the thick warmth track uh, across his skin. Um... The footsteps came closer and closer, then they stopped. Wade continued to hold his breath. He whirled himself not to think about where he was, and the footballs started up again. Sorry, footballs? And the footfalls started up again. They began moving away. Badass visual here. The mimic walked away, but he walked up onto the stage. The mimic is now standing on the stage, scanning the dining area for Wade. That was far enough. Now is Wade's chance. Bursting through his revolting hiding place, he steadied himself on his feet, and he ran. He ran fast, faster than he'd ever run before. Wade made it to the doorway to the back, uh, to the back of the hallway in seconds. As he headed down the hall, the dining room lights went out behind him. The creature was in pursuit. Joel wasn't sure how long he waited, clinging to the handholds in the chute just below the fan. It probably wasn't long, but his muscles were starting to spasm when he finally heard the sounds he'd been waiting for, pounding footsteps heading this way. The pounding paused for a nanosecond, and then the door to the systems room banged open. More pounding. Wade got into the chute. The lights in the systems room started flickering. Wade was fully in the chute now, his face covered in sweat. Stark white looked upward. His gaze met Joel's. Everything went silent. The chute went black. Wade screamed. Thudding. Pounding. Clanging. Metallic rat -a tat tats Another scream. Oh my gosh, yeah, that's so... Oh, I love the writing in these books, man. <laughs> That's so good. Um, this was all going on below Joel, but he didn't focus on that. He knew what it meant. Joel, help me. Joel, Joel, help me. Help me. Joel looked down into the darkness. He couldn't see Wade, but he didn't have to see what to know what was happening. The creature was killing his friend. He looked up. Between the sounds of struggle and violence, he listened for what he wanted to hear. And then he heard it. The fan had stopped whirring. No, he's going to leave. He's going to leave. This is getting interesting. It's rhythmic whoosh was winding down slower and slower. Wade is still screaming. Afton is giving Wade a very long death. Wade wailed. Then a 
A squelching wet grinding sound filled the chute, then a thud. Wade stopped screaming after minutes. Joel reached up in the dark and his knuckles encountered one of the nearly emotionless blades. He caught it and stilled the fan. He pushed himself upward, shoving his bulk through the narrow opening between the blades. The opening was a lot tighter than Joel had thought it would be. It was a big fan though and he'd hoped he'd be able to squeeze through it when it was stopped. He was wrong. No! I kind of want Joel to get out because then it kind of progresses the story a little bit, but yeah. Um, although Joel was able to get his head and neck through the opening easily, his shoulders were another story. He had to squirm to shove himself upward. He finally got his chest between two of the blades, but he was too big to get through. Although he grunted and strained, Joel couldn't move any further. Oh no, you know what's going to happen? He's going to get sliced by the fan when Afton moves away. <laughs> I bet you. Although he grunted and strained, Joel couldn't move any further. Um... He couldn't back up either. He was stuck. Joel listened to the clunking and clanging going on behind him. Oh, sorry, below him. He still couldn't see, but it sounded like the creature was pulling Wade's body out of the chute. Maybe it was going to take the parts of them back to the dining room to put them with the other cut-up bodies. Afton pulls the pieces of Wade out of the chute, and then silence. He's just standing there. He idly wondered what programming made a metal creature dismember a human, pile its pieces, and that was the last coherent, coherent thought he had. Wow. Wow. It's not even done. Okay, I thought it was I thought it was done. The lights in the systems room came back on. The fan reactivated its sharp blade <gasps> immediately began chewing through Joel's arms. Joel howled, his consciousness assaulted by the most pain he'd ever felt. It was worse than he could have ever imagined. The fan's blades picked up speed. They cut through Joe's Joel's arms and chest, cleaving him in two. The lower half of his body fell down the chute. Oh my gosh, Joel's brain continued to process the pain just for another couple of seconds as the fan began chomping the rest of him into bloody bits. Oh my god. Oh my god. Wow. Honestly, that was a great epilogue. That was really good. Have we only got two people left? This is like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> do we only have two people left? Or do we have four people left? I actually can't... I, I, I'm... i See, the thing about the epilogues... Like, I'm, I'm enjoying them. But they're all the same kind of. Like, obviously they're all different. But they're all based around the same thing. And they all have the same characters. And I'm not attached to the characters too much. But that might just be me. Anyway... Thank you for listening. This is going to be continued in the Bobby Dots conclusion, of course, uh, along with the second part of Bobby Dots, of course. And wow, that was great. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you when the Bobby Dots conclusion comes out. Goodbye.